Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. We will be continuing our Sabbath school study I'm uh, definitely thankful that we were able to get uh, to reach our fourth lesson and we were able to look in it um, this prior Sabbath. Let me make sure I'm recording. Definitely thankful to be able to um, start a new study and I believe we brought out some very intriguing uh, points as we looked into lesson four, which is crossing the Jordan last week. And one of the points we brought out last week was this idea of a faithful report. I don't know if anyone remembers um, the idea that we brought out about a faithful report. Um, one of the questions, well, question number one was about the report, and it says, what report did the spies bring back from Jericho? And so last week, we kind of looked at this idea of a report. And considering the spies, the prior spies, who was to go into the Canaan land, um, to bring back a report about the inhabitants, if the land was... Uh, prosperous and what have you the report that they brought back was what type of report evil. Uh, evil report right and as Joshua has sent in two more spies to go into another territory um, the report that the spies brought back we understand was a what type of report because it wasn't an evil report so it had to have been a good report or faithful. faithful report so the idea that we've seen last week was um, what makes a faithful report a faithful report how can you call it a faithful report what are the parameters or what what makes it a faithful report and um, we kind of brought out the fact that before they went in to gather intel or to make an assumption on what's inside the territory, the report had already been reported before the spies had went in to uh, gather their information to make a report. Now, if we turn to Revelation, turn to the book of Revelation, we're going to go to Revelation chapter 3, and we're going to see um, that there was already a report given. Who had given this report prior to them going in? Revelation chapter 3, and... We will be reading in verse the verse 14. And this report, or this uh, verse actually deals with us as a church in the Laodicean. Laodiceans. The Bible says in Revelation 3, verse 14, it says, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the what? Faithful and, true Faithful and what? True witness. true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Now, before the spies went into this uh, and went into Jericho to gather information for their report, their, the report that was given by them was already given beforehand. And the report was given by the true and faithful witness. Now, we have to consider that, and I actually reviewed the, 
the recording of last week. And I do want to clarify one thing. Last week it was said that a faithful report is a faithful report because of what you choose to believe. Right? Should I explain? Did we forget? Explain. Okay. Now, <clears throat> the spies went into Jericho and they said, the land, the inhabitants, everyone faints because of us. Right? Mm -hmm. Now that report was said before they even went in. Mm -hmm. Who was it said by? The faithful and true witness. Right? Okay. So, them going in and finding out that they faint wasn't because they had already seen it or because they was told or because they had witnessed this, but because it was already said. The faithful and true witness said, there shall not be a man that will be able to stand before you. Every place your foot treads shall be yours. Do we remember that? Okay, so in them saying that this is the case, they faint before us, does that make it a faithful report? Or the fact that when God told them that what happened, they believed it, went in, and found out for themselves, does that make it a faithful report? Yeah. Any comments? You have to believe? But because uh, an unfaithful person cannot give a faithful report. Okay. So first of all, they had to have believed what, what the word of God said. Okay. So therefore, when they went, they already had the faith. So when they came back, the faith was still with them. All right. So all right. it has to be that way. It can be okay. unfaithful if you can be faithful. All right. And I like that answer. Did anyone else want to chime in? I thought I'd seen the hand. No. Well, a faithful witness would have to tell the truth, wouldn't they? Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Faithful witness will have to tell the truth, but the truth that this faithful witness will be telling will already have been truth because it was said before they even found out. Eddie, did you want to share something? Okay. So, what makes this a faithful report is yes, brother. Um, what makes it a faithful report is that it has to come from the divine. It has to be a message. It originates from God, and that one would have to believe as well as it comes from God before uh, uh, the events take place. Yes, yes, that is true. What makes it affect? Yes, sister. Is it that also that because they actually experienced it for themselves? Okay, they experienced it. Now the experience will have to come after you will have been told what your experience will be. Now God said this will happen. So if that's going to happen, that will be your experience. Do we understand? If God said these people will melt before you, they won't be able to stand before you, and you go in and they can't stand, well, if God told you that will be your experience. Yeah. Yes. Sister, yes. But it's kind of like looking at the promises of God. And uh, Maybe I'm going out a little bit. But when the Lord said, you know, if you do this, this will happen. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that? Either you believe that or you don't believe that. And, and I think this is the same thing with the children of Israel and the spies going out. If this is a promise that was made to them. Yes. Do you believe that? I mean, there are conditions that must be met in yes. order to go through with that, to fulfill mm -hmm. that promise. Amen. So that's how I would draw that. You have a question? Yes, how? <laughs> so so these, these were faithful people. Okay. Why did they have to go in? Why did they have to yeah, go in? And we looked at this last week, yeah, actually. So the, the Lord already told them, you know, the line is yours for taking. Why did they have to send us two spies have to be sent in? Okay. And we'll answer that yeah. question. I'll take this comment. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, we're seeing the as we look into the Bible, what God is showing us is, I guess you could say, the full picture. So we got to consider from their perspective, or from everyone's perspective, they're just living real life. Okay, so 
the Israelites are there. God has told them that they can, you know, conquer the land and do all these things. But when they look at themselves, they don't have weapons. Mm -hmm. They have clothes that are growing with them, but not necessarily good condition or not necessarily new clothes. You know, they don't look like a lavish, luxurious, successful people per se. Um, and then when you look over at Jericho, it is a, a huge, glorious dynasty. I mean, it's just right. like this huge people Whoa. with everything, weapons, food, uh, bulwarks, a city that is protected. So you have to consider from the perspective of the great controversy, God has angels, God has spoken his word. So it's a different picture versus real life. So mm -hmm. we can't just look and say, well, God told them that it was going to happen. So they should have just, they should have, but you need faith. And one of the things that God does to strengthen faith is he gives multiple testimonies. So in this story, when he had, he had already said that, but he sent, one of the reasons he sends in spies is so that that can be confirmed by another testimony. Because there's a principle upon how multiple testimonies establishes that something is true. Mm -hmm. And I believe that God, for the most part, does that for humans. It's not for him, per se. Like, God knows that it is true because it is he is true. But God also understands the weakness of humanity and how our minds work. In real life, if somebody tells you a lie... And somebody comes back and confirms it. Somebody else comes. The more people who confirm the lie, guess what happens to us? We start to say, well, you know, man, maybe. Maybe it's true. So that's our tendency. So we see God uh, reconfirming his word. It's already true, but he's reconfirming it by the spies. The spies, when they come back, the spies are actually giving a testimony of someone else. So it's multiple testimonies being given to confirm the faith of God's people so really they can believe what he said from the beginning, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So just consider from an earthly perspective what they're viewing and how life looks it's like for us today. We know our past lives. We know we're terrible sinners. We're afraid of death. We're afraid of not having food. We're afraid of being cold. We're afraid of homeless. And God says, look all at all of that and says, you're going to be a victorious. You're going to be fed. You're going to be comforted. Mm -hmm. We have to do almost the same thing. So it's something to consider and to parallel to our time. Um, this story, I believe, is more important than we may know. And we should really, really consider where we fit in it. Just some insight. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. Now, a question that was asked was, if they were told already what was going to be the case of going into this land, if they were told everything that will happen, why would they be sent into the land? Why go if you already know? Well? You just have to just come into the land. Yes. Yeah. Because, I mean, the Lord always tries us and tests us. Okay. To see how faithful we are. Like, do you really believe? And so I think this was a test as well as a trial for them because same thing for us as we parallel our own lives. You know, we have, like I say, the, pro the, the promises in God's word. It's, you know, sometimes we, we, we're, we're, we have to go through trials just to make us, what it says, um, so that the rough edges can be worn off or, you know, purify us. It's the same thing. Okay. Um, I would look at it at that way. So this report was already a faithful report. But what makes it a faithful report on our behalf or in our lives is the fact that we agree with the report. It's a faithful report because when you were told what it was, you acted upon it or you put action to your belief or your faith or what you believe was told to you, right? So just to clarify um, on that, because uh, last week I said it was what makes it a faithful report is the fact that you um, believe it. But us and ourselves don't make the report faithful because it's already faithful. What we believe or what we show as our belief of the report 
that makes it a faithful report to us individuals. Um, so just to you know go back and uh, kind of look back on what we shared last week, uh, that's just a kind of a build up for question two for those who are not here. Uh, so we're going to go to question two now in our lesson. Uh, question two says, how long after the return of the spies before the march was begun to cross the Jordan? Mm -hmm. So how long after the return of the spies before the march was begun to cross the Jordan? And the answer it gives is Joshua 3 reading verses 1 through 3. If someone can read that, please. I can read it. <clears throat> and Joshua rose early in the morning, and they removed from Shittim and came to Jordan, and he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. And it came to pass after three days that the officers went through the host. And they commanded the people, saying, when ye see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, and the priest, the Levites, bearing it, then ye shall remove from your place and go after it. Amen. So, the question says, how long um, after the return of the spies, before the march was begun to cross the Jordan? Three days, right? Mm -hmm. Three days. Um, how significant is it? Well, I mean, because everything is three. I mean, mm -hmm. how significant? Because... You know, sometimes there's seven days, three days, you know, but here it was just three days. Not a week, not seven days, but three days. And I know there's some connotation to the number three. There's a lot of, uh, lot of insight on the number three that we can tie together. Our brother Eddie? Yeah, it seems that there's something more here also because the question asks how long after the return of the spies before the march was begun to cross the Jordan. Mm -hmm. Now, the text in uh, uh, Joshua 3, 1 says that in the, uh, it says, and Joshua rose early in the morning and they were moved from Shittim and came to Jordan. So the march began actually the very next morning, early in the morning was when they actually began to march towards, towards the Jordan. So it kind of reminds me of what Pastor was saying uh, this morning about um, Sister White and her husband praying and then immediately after praying, talking as though God has already answered the prayer. Mm -hmm. So it's like the, the spies come back, give the faithful report, and then immediately they begin to march toward the, to, uh, towards Jordan. So I think that this, this, uh, the question, the, the answer to the question is that it was, it was immediately, it was the very next morning that they actually began to, uh, to march, that the march actually began to, towards Jordan. Now, it was like a three-day wait after they got there, but they immediately began to march toward Jordan after they got to the report. Immediately, and, and it says early. Early, mm -hmm. early the next morning. And that gives us, that should give us a uh, boost in our own uh, selves. Uh, as we look at ourselves, we should see that when God says we should do something, we should be prepped, ready to go early in the morning, early as possible. <laughs> to get the job done that God has uh, called for us to do. Now, if we look in verse three um, of Joshua chapter three, um, something very, I thought was interesting. The Bible says in Joshua chapter three, reading in verse three, it says, and they commanded the people saying, when ye see the what? Ark of the, covenant. the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the priests of or the and the priests the Levites bearing it, then ye shall remove from your place and go after it. Now I thought this was um, I thought this was interesting because we see a similar instance of this being done um, in another place in the Bible. Now, before we go, um, let's kind of consider what the ark is. Now, what is the ark? What is the ark exactly? And I'll just draw a quick one. Is that not the, the depiction there to the right above? 
Yeah, but it's small. I didn't want it's to mess small. it up. It's kind of <laughs> looks perfect, so I didn't want to touch it. No. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to make it a little bit bigger. Yes. Where are you going? You know, going back to what Brother Eddie said about the early morning. I mean, as you go through Scripture, there's so many. Everybody always, you know, Abraham. It was always early in the morning. It wasn't like late afternoon, midday, whatever. It was always early in the morning when action take, takes place. And yes. I just wanted to emphasize that how, you know. Um, we, we shouldn't overlook that time frame. Thank you for that. So what, I don't want to, I'm not going to. So what exactly was the ark? What exactly was the ark? We can say it was. The presence of God was there, right? The presence of God was there, mm -hmm. yes. It was a vessel by which the, the law was held and carried with them, but also represented the, the, the throne of, uh, of God as well. Okay. Um, it also represented how God um, um, covers and protects his law. Mm -hmm. And also how he judges. Amen. Mercy seat. Very good, very good. Mercy seat. Mercy seat. Okay. God's Sister. presence with them. God's presence with them. Now, what our brother or what our, our elder shared was very good. And one of the words that he shared was the ark was a vessel. So has the ark ever been, uh, and the verse says that, and the priests, the Levites bearing it, then ye shall remove from your place and go after it. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the priests, the Levites, bearing it. Now, has the Ark ever been born? Speaking of bearing it, has it ever been born by priests in the New Testament? No. Trivia question. Is it? No. No. Can't think of it. No. Our brother said, is that a trick question? No, that's a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> no. It's not really. It's never mentioned that they carried it. Never mentioned that they carried it. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, the Spirit of Pops talks about where it was also uh, hidden. This is in the Old Testament, though. Okay. So yeah, after, not uh, an actual vessel. Not an actual vessel. Not the actual vessel, not the actual vessel. okay. Yeah, but they carried other parts of now, the ark was carried in the New Testament. <laughs> but the Bible's not going to say it, but it was. Now, as it was then, so it is now. So the ark had to have been carried in the New Testament, and even now, it has to be carried. How so? How so? Well, let's go to John. Turn to John. Now, we have to remember that as we study, we should not box our minds into a certain realm. Because the Bible has various symbols. Various symbols. God wants you to open your mind to his teaching into his symbols. Now in John 1, we're going to read in John 1, we will start in verse, uh, we can start in verse 29, reading down, just to get the whole picture. John 1, starting in verse 29, reading down. Now we want to find um, where the ark was carried in the New Testament. In John 1, verse 29, the Bible says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me. For he was before me, and I knew him not. But that he should be made manifest to Israel, therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. 
and I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God again the next day. After John stood and two of his disciples, verse 36 says, and what? Looking upon Jesus. And looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they did what? Follow Jesus. And they followed Jesus. Now, what we just read ties together with what we read previously. And it shows us that an ark is being born or carried by a priest. Okay, let's continue on. Verse 38 says, Then Jesus turned and saw them following and said unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? And he said unto them, Come and see. And then what happened? They came and they saw where he dwelt in the bowl with him that day. Now Joshua chapter 3 in verse 3. Joshua chapter 3 in verse 3. Joshua chapter 3 in verse 3. The Bible says that when ye see the what? Ark. The ark, right? When ye see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then ye shall do what? Remove from your place. Lord. Remove from your place and go after it. Now, is this not what we seen in the life of the disciples? What did they see after John said, there goes the Lamb of God? What did they see? Actually. They saw Jesus. They saw Jesus. Okay. Now, let's go a little bit further. We have various scripture songs that teach us about this idea of the law of God. Now we said the ark was a vessel, right? In 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6, the Bible says what? 2 Corinthians 4, the scripture song? For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined where? In our, hearts. In our hearts. What does the Bible tie with the heart? The law. The law or where is your heart? In the temple. Inside our sanctuary. Inside our sanctuary. Inside our, sanctuary. Inside our, our, our Bible temple. Now are we talking about our heart heart? Right hand over your heart? Over our, our mind. mind. Our mind, right? Yeah. So God commanded the light to shine in our hearts or in our minds, right? Mm -hmm. What for? Um, so we would see the character of God and be able to reflect that character within us. Okay. And the, the verse that give, goes with the song actually the explains why. To give the knowledge of God. To give the knowledge, mm -hmm. to give the, the light of the knowledge of the glory of, the glory of, the glory of God. Of God. Face in the face of Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus Christ, as he walked by, they seen him, or John said, there goes the Lamb of God. When the disciples seen the Lamb of God, they seen the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. What teaches us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God? Or what is what can we say will be the thing that gives us God's glory or his character? The knowledge of his character. The law. The law. The law teaches us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. But it's seen in the face of Jesus Christ. So if the light of the knowledge of the glory of God is seen in the face of Jesus Christ, 
we will have to say that the knowledge found in his face or the law that is found in his mind is also tied to being his vessel or his, the vessel that God uses to carry his law. Right? Amen. What's more interesting about that is it says that God commanded the light to shine in our hearts. Now, if the vessel is in your mind, and then you consider the Shekinah glory right above that, right? You consider the Shekinah glory shining over the mind, or in the mind, we can say. Because our mind is to be our vessel, where we are to carry the commandments of God. Is it not? Mm -hmm. Sister Beverly, did you want to ask? So, uh, so as you're as you're saying that, so you're saying that Christ is the vessel, and then so then that also makes us the vessel as an ark. Amen. So am, I, am I getting that correctly? You are getting it correctly. Now, uh, if we consider the the scripture song, it goes, "For God who commanded the light to shine in our hearts, have shine." Or for God who commanded the light hath shine in our hearts. Right? Mm -hmm. The light out of darkness to shine in our hearts. Mm -hmm. To give the knowledge, light of the knowledge. Light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And then it says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Right? Yes. Earthen vessels. What type of earthen vessel? Look at the our bodies, like body, huh? our mind, our bodies, earthen vessels, right? Mm -hmm. So, if we consider the fact that the mind is to be our vessel, or the mind is to be where God is to put his law, and God has said that I will, in those days, write my law upon their inward parts. I will write my law upon the heart, upon the mind. But it has also said that we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Now, is the law considered a treasure? More to be desired than gold. Ah, more to be desired than much fine gold, right? Much fine treasure. Amen. Now, what's interesting is if we go to Jeremiah, go in your Bible to Jeremiah. Chapter 31. In Jeremiah chapter 31, we will be reading in verse 31 down. Jeremiah 31, reading verse 31 down. Just to Just to make, uh, just to get context for this, it says in Jeremiah 31, verse 31, reading down, it says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. Although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law, where? Yeah, in, their in their inward parts and write it on what? In their hearts. Write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. So we see that this idea of the ark being a vessel carried in the New Testament and even now is not a far-fetched idea. Because as we discuss the scripture song saying that we have this treasure in earthen vessels. More to be desired is the law of God than much fine gold. Now what does that say about our time or our day? 
if we are to bear the ark of God even today, as it was done when Joshua was alive, what does that say about our position? Priest. Priest, right? But can anyone who considers themselves to be a priest or a Levite carry the ark? Not anyone, right? Now, to be a priest, you have to be undefiled and you have to be committed to service. If you were to touch the ark of God being a defiled priest, what would happen? Probably death back there. You will fall flat on your face. Mm -hmm. Ananias and Sapphira, right? Mm -hmm. So, for our case, if we are to bear the ark of God in this time, being priests, the defilement that we have in ourselves will corrupt us even more. So, why would we even touch the ark of God, or why will we even allow the ark of God or the commandments of God to be in our minds if we have no interest in getting rid of our evil character? Yes, sister? You know, uh, the rest of that, uh, that um, verse, verse 3 of uh, Joshua 3, the end of it, it says, I'll just read my When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, and the priest, the Levites, wearing it, then he shall remove from your place and go after it. So now, how do you relate that to us being the ark? When, how do you tie that part into it then? Then he shall remove from your place and go after it. Who, who, who would that be then in our case? If we are the ark, Christ, I know, I see that the, the disciples did follow Christ. Mm -hmm. But now for us, in our, in our situation, how do we, as the ark, then move, you know, where it says, then ye shall remove from your place and go after it. Yes. How do you tie that in? I mean, I, I see the other point, but I just want to know how you would tie that part in. Yes, and I would say, by beholding, you become changed, right? But us, if we have the ark within us, we will be beholding Jesus, right? Now, what about others? What about others? By beholding, you become changed. Not everybody who's seen Jesus followed him. Right? Yes or no? Did everybody who John said, look, there goes the Lamb of God. Did everybody look and follow? No, right? So by beholding, you become changed. Those who witness us on the outside can become changed. Did you know that? Why? Because they see the ark. What you just read, it said, when you see the ark of the Lord, remove from your place and follow it, right? Now, they have a choice. When they see the ark of the Lord in you, they have a choice. Now, it's not when you see it, follow it right now, or you're going to be destroyed. No, they have a choice. So when they see the ark of the Lord in you, what do you think will happen if they choose to follow? They will remove from their place, which is their sin condition and they will seek to follow you or to follow Jesus within you the hope of Lord I was going to say too also generally when you um, study the sanctuary the sanctuary is a revelation of Christ um, you can see that in every part of the furniture if you study it deeply mm -hmm. um, so the, the example in Joshua chapter 3 of when you see the ark removed from your place and follow it is applicable uh, to us in a more spiritual sense uh, than a literal sense. When you look at the disciples, when they saw Jesus, they followed him. I mean, you just consider a man coming up to you and saying, leave your life and follow me. Well, they had to see something there uh, yeah. that would entice them, uh, encourage them to follow and she talks about that in Desire of Ages, uh, when she talks about the experience that the disciples had in meeting Christ and what would happen when people saw Christ. Um, and the same thing uh, applies to us today <laughs> spiritually. When we behold Jesus, we follow, we drop our life. And what we're beholding in Christ is the fulfillment of the law mm -hmm. for the most part. So it applies in a spiritual sense to us 
Um, that's just one of the parts of Joshua 3 that we're emphasizing today that has to do with following Christ. But um, pretty much everything in the experience of Israel represents Christ in some way. Um, someone mentioned the three days. Three in the Bible represents God's being. Uh, in Revelation, God says, uh, or the Bible talks about Jesus uh, was is and is to come that the division of three is always used to uh reveal god's being or god's presence mm -hmm. um so um in all those things it's always a revelation of christ to us with the invitation to follow christ so that's how we are to interpret joshua chapter three god is trying to teach us the law is very important, and that is what you should follow. You should leave your place. You should put away your life with the desire to obey the law of God. This is this, that same principle was taught in the life of Christ. It doesn't. We don't see the Ten Commandments walking around, mm -hmm. but Christ says, "Follow me. I am the way." Well, the way was in the sanctuary. What do you mean the way was in the sanctuary? When you make it all the way through the process of sac sacrifice and washing and candlestick. The ultimate goal was to get in front of the, the ark. Mm -hmm. And the reality is you can't get in front of the ark. And that was because you're a lawbreaker. But once that law is, I'm not, I shouldn't say once the law is, once that uh, sin is restored or cleansed, then you have the opportunity to stand in front of the law that you look like, if that makes sense. Amen. And... As the Bible has said, we have this treasure, or we have the law in earthen vessels. So let us be the vessel that God desires us to be. Let us be what God would want to sit upon and reign over. As you see this Shekinah glory sitting above the ark, let us be those who allow God to sit above us, to be our king and our influence. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we come before you at the foot of your throne, and we know that it is your desire to reign over us, even as a God. We know that it is your desire for us to carry the treasure in these earthen vessels. And we ask that as we consider this and the story that has been given, even the questions of this lesson, that we would seek to change our thinking and change our perspective on the ark being of old. For we know that the ark is a vessel a vessel that you sought to put the commandments in, a vessel that you use the commandments to be part of a big lesson, even the sanctuary. So for us, as we are to be vessels and vessels which hold the law within inside them, we pray that we will also be a part of a big purpose, even a purpose to reveal more about the sanctuary and its message unto others. For by beholding, you become changed. So if those on the outside are to look upon us, we want them to see the Ark of the Covenant. And we want them to see the Shekinah glory. We want them to see the mercy seat from our appearance as the disciples have seen in Jesus Christ as he passed by. We thank you for giving us the opportunity to look in the lesson, even if it was for a few questions. For with little, you can do much. And we pray that as the Sabbath continues on, you would not depart from us, but that you would continue to stay with us, that your Holy Spirit will guide our minds and influence us for that which is beneficial to your cause, and may we choose that which is right and not which is evil. These things we ask and pray in the name of Jesus. 
Amen. Praise God. 